Welcome to episode two of this uh, Let's Play series of Age of Wonders 4, which is the pre-release version of the game. So there may be some changes uh, as we sort of play through that are different uh, in the in the actual release version. Anyway, I thought we'd start off with uh, what to do in terms of the provinces and, and the way that it sort of does expand. If you wanted to sort of see the way the, the whole world is sort of uh, generated, you can sort of go back to like a cloth map a little bit, which does give you a, a bit of a better look at the different resources around. Actually, there's still another location. Didn't I pick that up? I thought I picked that up. I mustn't have picked up the gold stash. I think I might have shown it, but they're not actually gone and grabbed it. <laughs> anyway, you can click basically anywhere on the world and it will then sort of show the provinces, or you can actually just go across and click on this economic overview. And what this one does is it does give you a bit of a feel for what you can expand into. And you can see there that we've got like a, a lot of the areas we're going to be able to get ultimately will be like farms or foresters. These, these are basic sort of building um, uh, um, uh, the basic buildings for the provinces, so farm and quarry in that instance. In through this one we've actually got a farm that we can build and these are, these are active ones that we can sort of see in through this side. But you may sort of want to be thinking ahead a little bit and think, okay, how do I, how do I plan ahead for, um, for what I may need to do? And so for example, we've got ourselves over through here, a, a mana node, a, a mana resource node. And so that will give us the option to then build a research post at this location or a, um, a conduit so we can get more mana uh, or a quarry. They're the three different things we can build on that particular location. These ones here, we've got ourselves a gold mine and through this a gold vein. And so we can build in this one a gold mine underneath this one, which will then give us like a lot of gold income. Or we can go and build a farm and sort of get more. more. You can see there the gold vein will still give us the same amount whether it's a farm or a gold vein. The, the difference is, is that ultimately we're going to get, end up with a lot of farming land uh, in around here, but we still want to be getting farms pretty early. <laughs> and unfortunately, we've got like an iron mine in through this side or an iron vein, a rich vein full of iron, which does give us the option to then build a quarry at that location, or if we wanted to, a gold mine. This will then give us extra production and uh, extra gold as well. Then we can always change these over the course of um, you know, about three turns to sort of change them to something else. I sort of want, I would love to get a farm, but I also do want to get, in fact, this is another one where we've got like another mana node there another mana node there so we've got like two mana nodes that we can sort of that then go and create so it's rare for us to be able to get research posts it's rare for us to get um, conduits to get the actual mana from these locations so it may be worth going for something like this we know that we're going to be needing gold in the like all the way through the game really but so it may be worth getting a mine at that location the trouble is though that when we actually go and have a look back in here to see what we can actually then go and build all of the boosts like that's a farm boost that's a farm this one's a quarry okay well that's actually not too bad um that one there is a forester and then this one's a forester as well so we've got two foresters one one quarry but none of them require a mine and so do we for example um come back in and get the quarry from here which then gives us the quarry income it's the only quarry that we can sort of see that is sort of um, applicable you know when we do turn these things on actually we're not seeing it now it's a bit of a bug oh there we go <laughs> yeah so with that now unselected so we actually we do have a few quarries around the place ultimately there's another gold vein in through there as well so we're gonna we, if we sort of ex extend out this way we will pick up some things uh, we're also extending out through this other side as well but we've got like a um, uh, terrain mushroom forest in through this other side as well where we can sort of do other things uh, so it's a hard choice like in this case because quite often if you've got like a farm that you can build you'll build that one straight away because it gives you the farm to allow you to build other things I'm tempted to go straight for the gold mine or for the uh, ma mana or the research but I think that ultimately it's going to speed my development up a little bit more by going with the quarry so let's just go that way so when we go and click on that one Oops, hang on, why is it not doing anything? I'll just go and select it. There we go. It's built automatically. It doesn't have to build. It's actually now already in there. And if we go back to um, to our city, then just go across and, we, and have a bit of a look, we can then sort of see the, um, the provinces. We now have a quarry 
that is built in, inside here. Now you see there that also it's now impacting the happiness of the city. It's reducing it by five. And so that's unfortunately the bigger the city grows and the more we actually build these things, the more unhappy the city will become as well. So we have to manage that as well through different buildings. So structure that, that uh, claims the province and expands the domain, uh, this is gonna be the, um, so that's actually basically what the quarry then does. It does give us a, a plus five extra of the uh, production. And we also then have in this case, we've got the iron deposit, which gives us another 10. So that's sort of what's happening. But we can go and change this one and flick it and just go and say, OK, look, what are we going to change it to? And we can change it to something different if we wanted to. So we can chop and change eventually. We can start to specialise the cities afterwards. So that's a, that's certainly available to us. All right, that's uh, all we need to do at this point in time. Let's just go and turn that off. Uh, orders required. Now, this is actually still on top. Let's just go across. Select this uh, location just so we can sort of see what's going on. Now, what's interesting here is Flint Wall. That's the capital of Arctica. Now, Arctica is is a problem, <laughs> a big, big problem. So she's evil already. Um, so this is sort of basically what how things are working. Her race is the gnarled frostlings, and so based on humans. So frostling transformation. Um, it's got fast repercussion. Is the traits that she actually has. So it generates an additional five health. So when she goes raiding, she's going to be able to heal up quickly. Uh, she's got Arctic adaptation. So snow and ice terrain costs negative two movement points and able to build farms on snow terrain. Uh, she's a barbarian. Now that means that we can expect to see um, shock troops and we can expect to see um, skirmisher troops. So they'll be the sorts of things. Now that means we may need to change how we operate. Uh, melee units have primal strike dealing extra damage on their first strike in combat which is again a bit of a problem um, so we're going to have to sort of be mindful how we actually deal with them when we go into the attacks ruthless raiders so they murder without remorse more interested in loot and plunder than right or wrong the nearest city so every time, every time they do anything they basically get um, well they've got two random hero items as well but they do actually end up with extra drafting bonus and extra gold bonus every time they kill a unit and then powerful evokers as well. So the battle mage unit and support units have plus one rank, and they also give them extra uh, combat casting points at the start of combat. So it means there could be some pretty nasty spells coming through as well. They do start with an extra battle mage unit or support unit as well in their actual army. So quite a bit going on there with, with her, um, with the Gnarled Frostlings. So um, what else is there? Flint Wall is their throne city, which we now are aware of. Uh, protective sage so this is a personality so um, now she likes empires that have summoned units she likes empires with vassals now that's not going to be us for quite some time just likes empires with a larger domain just likes empires that start wars um, so the strategy so the strategy informs their behavior on the strategic map so favors treaties war must be justified exploration and expansion so these are the various things that she's likely to do prefers forming treaties with other rulers and will not break any treaty or alliance they have. That's good to know. The uh, ruler must not go to war over minor grievances and will want to justify their war. So we need to have major grievances, even though she hates us, we have to be careful. So she's not likely to go to war with us um, without good justification. So I think we may have a bit of time here, which would be good. The ruler favors ex exploring the map, seeking out potential resources such as pickups and ancient wonders. That's good. And expansion. The ruler favors expanding their empire by building and absorbing cities. They focus on improving their cities and defending them. All right, so that's actually her personality, basically. So that's what we're up against. Uh, just go back across. Well, there's another underground passage. Let's go under there and see what we can find. Now, who's that? So this is a tier three shock unit. This is going to be very, very strong. If we can just right click to then bring it open. And so we can then sort of see what they've actually got. They've already got frost blades attached. So there's a 20% uh, damage against, um, so 20% damage against frozen and slowed units. You've got the frosting transformation, so immunity to, to frozen. Um, I thought they'd actually have negatives with fire, but they don't. <laughs> That's a shame. That is a shame. So they've got the, then the heavy charge does a lot of damage. All right, so that's going to be a difficult one for us to, to contend with. Uh, let's end our turn. Now they're all already able to cross the water. <clears throat> I'd love to start up in here somewhere, but I don't think I can. All right, let's just go underground here. 
Now there's a uh, silver. It's going to be too much for us to be able to, to deal with. Now again, if we sort of zoom back out, there's a, um, looks like there's lava back out through this other side. And there's one little area back over through here. Let's just see if there's anything we can find just while we're here. So if we go to this one and dig that. Okay. Now, now we've actually opened up the, um, we're essentially inside the Empire development, but we still don't have access to it other than when something is developed like this. And so what we actually have is we, I think we must have started with this one here, and the ability for Phoenix to excavate earthen terrain in the underground, which is what we're sort of able to be, to be doing at this point in time. As we look into the other different things, you can see there that we're getting plus six per, uh, per income per turn. Uh, back in the general area and that's pretty much what everyone else is going to be getting as well that's the uh, when you add up all of your uh, affinities um, that will also then be applied to the general slot but we have an affinity for materium which is three and we have a th and one as well for chaos and so this will then just give us a little bit of every turn and then we've just unlocked um, defeating an infestation grants you a unit based on the infestation defeated so this will be a cheap way for us to, to build up an army. Now we've got 160 points, that one's going to cost me 50 to get that one. And through the uh, Materium, materium uh, Affinity, we actually have this one through here. Outpost costs nearly 50% gold less and take one turn less to build and start with a Palisade War structure built. So that would actually also be a good one for us as well pretty early. Um, we do have the, uh, the Seafaring, which I don't think we need at this stage. I'm thinking I might grab at least this one, maybe both of them. So let's go at that one and this one. So we're going to be able to, because we, outposts, we are going to have to start building outposts. We need to expand. We need to be able to, uh, to uh, you know, compete, essentially, which is um, going to be fairly hard. Uh, now we've got Pyromancer. Has now been, we've now actually brought the Pyromancer in. So a Battle Mage unit that spreads fire and inflicts burning. Let's select new research. Fiery Arrows is one that we do want to get as well. So let's go and get that one now. So this is a unit in enchantment. Now we're only getting plus 20 mana, which means we're going to have to try to sort of end up getting mana. Now this is, um, we've got the small monster den through here. By, by picking that particular affinity, uh, we're going to then be able to go and do more with that one. So we've got, uh, this is actually the Anvil Guard that was actually just brought in should be another one. Where, where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? But uh, five. But this one as well. Now that one doesn't get close enough. Let's just go and pick up this. Okay, we've opened up this forest in through that side. We can't get through there really so much. There's more, there's more that we can sort of... Uh, looks like we can do a bit more over this other way. That's as far as we can go there. So we just picked up a heap of gold. Um, now we've got the the next anvil guard that we sort of all were picking up as well. Let's just go and move that one across. Let's move this one in. And let's not get this one just yet until we can bring more units back in to actually do the fight. So let's now just go across and we'll now open this one up. Now sometimes you can, it can expose bad things and sometimes it can be, you know, it can be fine. So um, you now we'll just leave this one and we'll bring this one across and get this one ready to move across as well. Okay, we'll end our turn there. Turns are nice and fast at this point in time. Okay, looks like we didn't actually open anything else up. As we open up more land though, it may be worth looking at one of these areas to build another city. Like certain of these we can't actually sort of exp expose too much. Now the way combat works, let's actually do that now because um, we can actually do take on the small monster den. If we have a bit of a look at this one, it's just a bronze invest infestation spawner, which means it's fairly weak. Uh, deep sleep, the infestation will become active in nine turns. And we do want to just get on with things as well. So I think now is a good time for us to go and do this one. We've got, um, this is the only one that, that had uh, moved. So I'll just go and select everything else. You can't do the old trick of of clicking on a unit and then right clicking to um, to do the inversion. It doesn't have that anymore in the game, or not, certainly not at this time. Uh, but one of the, so you have to go and click on the actual units you do want to select now. Um, so that was an old trick from Age of Wonders. Uh, but anyway, if we come back through, now 
In the old game, you had to be right up around it to be able to then attack it. And you, if you had six uh, stacks in and around it, you could attack with six stacks. It doesn't work that way anymore. What it does is it picks up pretty much anyone within three of your uh, of your group and then adds them into the fight. So if we go and grab this unit, for example, and then go and click on this one here, view which armies would aid this army in battle if it was attacked. So we can actually see that that one is actually going to highlight this one over here. It doesn't highlight this one over this side. It's too far away. So it's just within three. And you can see there uh, it's showing us a little red dot around where the actual unit, if our unit is attacked, they would help in the, in the actual fight itself. In this case, this one can't move anymore, but this one can still move. And if I highlight over here, this is a very safe battle for us to fight, as you can sort of see when we, when we hover over it. But the other unit will still come in because it's within, again, you see that, that red border. The red border, it's inside the red border, so it's going to participate. Now, only three stacks can, have a, can actually fight at a time, not the six stacks of the old game. So we're just going to go and right click. And um, this is going to be an easy one, but I would strongly suggest that you get used to fighting uh, the, the battles, particularly even the easy ones, because you will learn an awful lot about the game by doing that and also how to then tackle different sorts of things. Now, before you go in or even when you're in there, you can actually just go and right click on the actual units to see what they do. And so these are hunter spiders. These are fighter units, which we haven't seen yet. Uh, we did go through the different types of units that, as a player, you can grab. But fighter units are just basically outright melee units with no obvious specialization or counters. These are basic combat fighting animal type units. So they don't actually have any nuance about them. Uh, in this case, they're tier two. So they're above our tiers. Um, these are raw recruits. And so they basically don't have any benefit. They're not, they're not soldiers. They're just at the very, very start. So. These don't have any actual extra skills. They don't have any extra hit points. Uh, they, they, they just do what they do. It does have 70 hit points. It's got three defense, and um, and it does. It's got um, uh, two resistances there as well, and so it, it resists against different sorts of things, against blight. It's got some natural blight protection as well. Yeah, sorry about that. I just had a phone call. This is um, blight resistance. It's already got four blight resistance plus the two from the resistance gives you a total of 47% essentially protection from blight. Uh, in through here, you see it's 27% physical protection. Um, so that's sort of where it's getting its, its, its extra defense from. It's got all these different aspects about them as well. So it's got animal. If I go this side, it's a spider unit. Uh, it's a, um, so that's a spider. What's this other one? That's underground camouflage. This, this unit cannot be detected when standing on uh, underground cave hexes, so it can sort of hide underground. It's a, uh, got land movement, so it moves over land hexes. Forest walk can move through forest costs. It costs fewer movement points, so it's, it's, it's good at doing that one. Won't affect us at all. Forest camouflage as well won't affect us. <laughs> Fighter unit, an outright melee unit. We saw that one before at the top there. Uh, this is the ex expedited movement underground. So this unit has increased movement on cavern floors. It's a mushroom forest, uh, fu fungus fields and rocky. Uh, it's then also got evolved. So this unit will transform into a more powerful unit when it reaches champion rank. So when we look at its actual area through there and hover over this one, if it can get to champion level, it will then evolve into a, 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 a hunter spider matriarch. And so this then becomes like a, a tier four fighting unit, which is very, very strong. And so these are uh, this then takes it up to a really, really strong unit. So if it can get to that level, it will recruit. Now there's a lot more of these sorts of entities in the game. And a lot of the games you actually don't get to bring in the high level. You have to wait for the evolution to happen, which is really, really good. It actually, again, just these, these little changes that have been made, which has just been brilliant. And it's also an animal unit. Uh, it's got a melee strike and it does actually do a little bit of blight damage and a little bit of physical damage there as well. Um, and it, when it strikes the enemy target, it's got it, it's got immobilized. So base 30% chance of inflicting immobilized for one turn, which is a bit like using the web. Now, the web is like a ranged attack, which has got a range of four. So it deals damage in a one hex radius and immobilizes and based 60% chance of inflicting immobilized for one turn. So this is actually just you know indicating that, that units get caught up in the web. It's got the ability to jump. So it can jump up to three hexes in the actual combat. It's got a defensive mode in through there, which everything it actually does have. It gains plus two defense 
and plus two resistance. Uh, low maintenance, so unit upkeep is reduced by negative 25%, not that it matters for animals in the wild. And it's swift, so this unit ignores the effects of terrain in combat. And so that's actually what we're up against. So we're looking at something that does actually have an interesting web attack, can jump into different locations, so we're going to, have to be careful of that at range three. So just be aware of what they are. Now, the three little dots that we see through there basically means that it can it can move and then act and then have one more action point left over. That's what that means. If we go to web, you can see there that it's got three actual action points that are highlighted. It has to do that before it moves. So it has to then sort of try to um, cast the web from within four. If it moves, basically it won't be able to do that. The melee strike is sort of showing that it's it's essentially one action that can trigger three times. So if you've got three action points, you get three shots. If you've got two, you get two shots. One, you get one shot. That's sort of how that one then sort of works. So we have to then start thinking, okay, four hexes is an important number for us because of the web. Uh, so we have to sort of try to sort of maintain a bit of distance until we can close in and then do the damage. So that's sort of what we'll be sort of looking at. Um, okay, so we'll go and um, close this one. So there's two of them, same same deal for both of those. If you if they've got a, a medal, you'll see the medal on the side there. These are both just recruits. So we'll do manual combat. Now, our units have also then got different abilities, which we'll have a look at when we get into the combat itself. Again, get used to what your units are good at. The game is beautiful. God, it looks good. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the actual battle maps are generally smaller than what they have been in previous games. Um, now we're doing the attacking, so we do actually still we can still move out and escape if we needed to. Uh, the other thing we actually have is that you'll notice that all of our units get brought into a line of attack, and so we've got the one unit that was on its own back over this side, and we'll have a look at what all of our different units do as well uh, as we sort of come in. Now this one here, we have to be careful of the um, of what it's doing as it moves in. Now if I highlight that one, when it goes to there, it's only got two action points to one, one. So it's got one action point to there. So if it moves, it can't use the web cast. So the webbing is uh, at range four. And so the web, if I have the web sort of selected, comes out to there. So I can actually fire the web out to that location. I think that's how far it is. Two, three, four. If I just go to this one here. Actually, no, that, that is just the movement that we're looking at when we do, do highlight that one. Yeah, it is just movement. So I need to make sure it's still the same deal anyway. It's still four is the actual movement that they actually have. So we need to get into a position where we can do what we have to do um, close enough so we don't have to go through too much of what we're doing. So we've got our pikeman unit. If we just go and uh, right click on the on the actually left click on this one in through here. It's, again, it's sort of funny. It's left click when you're in the in the combat, right click when you're not in the combat. So we've got a fair few things going on through here. Uh, if we have a look, we're a pole arm unit, of course, um, being, being a pole arm. <laughs> Forgeborn is the group that we're from, so we're, there may be different uh, you know, aspects about this one, like prolific swarmers may have an impact. Your tier one units have one plus one rank, this one doesn't have that. Uh, this is a soldier unit, it has gone up a, a level anyway. And so it's now, it's no longer a recruit, it's a soldier, which means it's got extra hit points. So we've got it instead of it being 75 it's now 81 so we've now got 81 hit points we've got good defense back and through this side no na no native protections with what we actually then get to do uh, the melee strike does um, does again 12 damage but it just strikes once th uh, three times so it's one action point and but can strike up to three times a normal defensive mode so it'll just go into if we put it into defense it will um, ex extend its zone of control into adjacent hexes and it will then just gain two defense and two resistance so that's just just normal it does have these extra abilities though it's got bolstering so once per turn this unit gains bolstered defense when it hit by a melee or physical ranged attack bolstered resistance will hit uh, when hit by a, a magic attack and so what it does is it bolsters the actual um, like it actually gains a bit of defense so you get plus one defense for every attack that comes in and plus one resistance for every attack that comes in. So that's the bolstering aspect that we get. It's got bul uh, Bulwark. So Bulwark is actually one of these defense modes where we get two defense and two resistance if we go into defense mode. And so by going into defense mode, our, our abilities go up to five and four. So it's actually very, very strong. We've got very strong defense uh, being 
in the, in the defensive mode. So the, our defensive mode is actually enhanced. Uh, we're charge resistant, which we sort of saw back in episode zero. Uh, e excavation we have already unlocked uh, because we've got the underground, um, underground adaptation. Uh, first strike because we're a pole arm unit. Rune of Retaliation, because what, that's what we chose at the start, so it reflects 40% of damage sustained from melee attacks back into attackers. So this is from the um, from the setup that we had at the very, very start, and we're watchful. So unit has plus one retaliation attack. So we retaliate twice, not just once. Retaliation is a bit different in the game as well. So this is a very, very good unit. It, it, it's tier two, but it is very, very solid. Back over through here, if we have a look at our shield unit and just go and left click down on the on the in through this side, these have got uh, so this is actually just our shield unit back in through this side. 78 hit points, so still a lot of hit points. Five defense, but no real resistance. So we have to be careful that we don't have any, any native resistances to blight, shock, fire, spirit, or frost. Um, the melee strike is less at eight. Uh, with one each time. It does have taunt, so the target enemy unit is inflicted with a base 90% chance of becoming taunted for three turns. The unit that uses the skill enters into a defensive mode. So it's, this is a mode we can use to actually taunt a unit and to get it to attack us. And so these are shield units, they're, they're designed to take damage. Uh, defense mode is a shield wall, and so this unit ends its turn and goes into a defensive mode, extending its zone of control to all adjacent hexes. And so it, it does give, um, so it actually, sorry, it, it does it anyway, but it, it, the, um, the shield wall does give extra defense and resistance to those around it. So all adjacent friendly units get, sorry, not resistance, just defense. So we get another plus three. So we can actually, by interspersing these guys in amongst other forces, we can end up with a very, very strong defensive line. Uh, so it feels very dwarfish, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, shield defense back and through there, uh, plus three defense against non-flanking attacks, and watchful. So again, plus one, one retaliation uh, attack with this particular unit. So we'll just close this one. Um, the uh, next one we might have a look at is the Arbalist. And so this one here is a um, bit more simplistic. We've got shoot crossbow, then we've got a, a, a an overdraw crossbow which actually sort of does more damage, but we can't move with that one. This is a single shot. We, we can sort of move anywhere we like and then fire. So we don't have to be stationary. This one here, we have to be stationary to use it. We need three action points to, do, to use it. Uh, again, it's got bolstering, so bolster defense when hit by melee. So it's just going to get better and better at defending itself. Uh, bulwark, so again, grants plus two defense, uh, defensive mode, if we do go into defensive mode and excavation. So again, we've sort of got, so this is fairly basic. Uh, if we go to our support unit back over this way and go and click on this one, this one is the, uh, is the steel shaper. So it's got a steel blast and this one again, we can move anywhere we like. It's only, it only takes up one action point, but we've only got one shot. So single magical attack at target unit. It is affected by line of sight rules, cannot be used if it's in the enemy zone of control. And so they'll be trying to close the gap in against these particular support units. This one's only got like one, res one defense and, uh, and three resistance. So it does have some resistances. It does actually have status resistance. So it reduces the chance that the unit will, be unit will be affected by negative status effects. And so the current chance reduction is 19% for that. So that's things, for example, like burning or, or free freezing, things like this. Uh, strength from steel in through this side. This, these are different actions that we can then go and do. Anything in a diamond shape it means it's something that you can actually do. Anything in like a square shape just means it's, a, it's an aspect of the actual unit itself. So we've got uh, defensive mode of warding. Again, we've got that combined with bulwark. So we sort of then get like different other defensive modes coming back in. Uh, grant defense, so target uh, friendly unit gains plus two bolstered defense uh, in through there. So we can actually go and, and Add on even more defense to a um, to another uh, another unit if we if we wanted to, and then strength from steel in through here we can heal uh, we can heal units up to a, a small amount heals um, and it does actually they do gain strengthened, and so strengthened gives them plus ten percent damage and we can have that one stack multiple times if we need to, so that's where we are um, with our different units plus our hero as well, we might as well have a look at him. So he is a support unit as well. He's got a magic blast, which does fire damage. Uh, he's got a quick stab if he does need to go into a melee into a melee sort of attack. He can restore up to 10 hit points, and, and also the unit that he does that to will get regeneration, 
which this unit heals six temporary hit points at the end of its turn in battle. So this units can regenerate uh, a little bit over time during the battle, which is quite useful. Uh, so defense mode warding, if he does go into defense, he's got bulwark and excavation. So there we are. Uh, he's got different different elements as well, or different items. So again, we want to make sure that we're not close to that area there. So let's go and move, first of all, we'll move this one up. I might just move it in even closer. Bring both of those in. Now there's no area of effect attack that we can that we can expect. So we're pretty safe with everything we're doing. Let's just move that one in. It's not actually connected with any of the others, but that's okay. Now, if we go and we're probably not going to be able to fire through there all that effectively. So what I think I'll do is I'll move the commander down into here. By the way, if you sort of hover over different areas, we can have sort of obscured areas if we needed to. So we're just going to move this one down. And I think I might swing it over. It's a bit often a bit risky to sort of move things around away from everyone else. But this will be this should be an easy fight for us. Still have units that can act, they'll just go into defensive mode. Now what you'll see is they'll all go into different sorts of um, shields and you've got the, the shield wall in through there. So they're coming through. Again, they can't do anything. So Bulwark was up and now it's taken away because we're now starting the next round. You can see there I can actually move in. There is a retaliation strike and there's a 30% chance to immobilize it. Um, in through here was, was a little bit too far away to make use of this. Now, a tip I'll give you uh, for doing the sorts of attacks that you might be wanting to do in through here is to um, is to just try to sort of, uh, like as, when you're trying to do an attack, press, you get used to pressing the control button because what it will then do is try to, it'll give you some information about how things actually sort of do work. So for example, when I'm not pressing control, the retaliation is giving us sort of like 10 damage, which is showing it's gonna be physical and blight. If I do press control, I then get more information, six physical, four blight damage coming back. And so we, it's gonna do more damage back to us. And there's a 30% chance we're gonna be immobilized as well. So let's not do that because we already have the, um, the, uh, the defensive mode of shield wall that we can place up, plus we've got the bulwark ability anyway, which we just had a look at. So I'm just going to move these into position. I'm going to use my ranged units to try to then do the damage. Now we have to be careful because of the ability that they have to then use the jump. So they can jump at three, and so, we, so they will come in behind us. And so I'm just going to go and move in initially and just sort of get this thing, thing to actually happen. Now if I move in directly into this location, um, I'm then going to be in the way of these guys trying to use their range attack. And so if I just go back across, now the thing with these two, we already saw that this particular attack has only got like one action to be, to, to be used. So I can move right in up up in behind it and then still use the attack. But the but the archer, oh sorry, this one this one is the same as well. He's not a normal archer. Um, we don't actually have any real abilities in through here, so if I've, I will I will be able to move in with all of these units to then sort of do what I have to do. So let's just go and give that a bit of a go. By the way, if you are, if you sort of end up making mistakes, just restart the combat. So the game is designed to be safe scumped uh, because it is complex. So um, I'm just going to move these in. Now I could attack if I wanted to, but I don't want to. I'm just going to move these guys in. By the way, also get in the habit of um, of thinking ahead. Like some sometimes you'll have abilities where you can do more damage if you wait for a unit to be next to you, and if that's the case, then then make use of that. Now, how far can we bring this one in? We can bring that one into the middle. This one's our most risky one, I think. So let's go and move that one into the middle. And you can see there when I hover over, as I move in, you can see the the the, the little percentages. This is awesome. The game hasn't had this before. So if I move to there, I've got a 70% chance on that particular uh, unit in through that side. If I go to that one, it's 50 and then 30. If I go to that one, it's 90 and then 50. And if I go to that one, it's 90 and 90. So that's a good spot for that one to go. If I go to that one there, I've got a 90 and 50. And if I use this one over here, I've got 90 and 90 as well. So I've got like a few different choices in through here. So let's go and move that one across into that location which is the maximum it can move, but it's still got one action, which is all it requires to make use of this particular attack. And so I'm gonna use one of these crossbows to now fire at one of these. Now, it doesn't really matter whichever one I go for. 
So we'll just do that one. We've got 12, 12 damage. Now, I should point out the 90% is important. I will actually explain how that one works when we do these other ones, because when I go into here, I've got 90 and 90 to sort of then go and look and see what does go on. So I'm going to go this way. Now, when I do this one, and if I, if I press control again, if there's anything to show, it will then sort of show it. Now, I've got a, I've got a percentage chance here of causing burning. So I will actually attack. I could attack this one as well. I might do this one just so we focus on one initially, and then we can sort of focus on the other one after this one. So if I go that way through there, I'm going to be doing 11 fire damage with a 60% chance to cause burning for three turns. Now, the 90% is important because what the way it works is there's a 90% for it to actually get a hit. Then you've got another 25% on top of that of grazing, and then, and then anything beyond that is, uh, is a miss. So when you've got anything 75% or over, you'll still do some damage. If it's under 75%, like if it's 70%, there's a 5% chance you're gonna miss. And so it works the same as in Planetfall. It doesn't seem as bad in this game as it does in Planetfall, to be honest. Uh, you just got to, because I think because you can see the numbers as you're moving, which you couldn't do in Planetfall, but also if you know that that's what's happening, 25% above that, that amount is the graze. So I've got a 10% chance of this shot missing or you know, grazing the, the enemy. And no, we actually got it, but it did resist the burning. So it's, we didn't sort of get the, the burning happening in, in through that side. Now we've got this unit in through this side. We're just going to move this one in. And um, and so again, I've got another 90% another chance in through this side. This one doesn't do anything extra. It's just physical damage. Again, a magical attack. And it's down to about 50%. Now I could actually attack it, but it's, I'm not going to do much. The retaliation will sort of be a little bit too much as well. Now what I can do is I'm more worried about this guy here because he doesn't actually have any any uh, any actual defences. So he's in a bit of a bad way. So I'm just going to move this, this unit in behind and then use the shield wall there. Now, if I end the turn now, all of the units that didn't move, they're all the ones with a little white dot on them, are still going to be active. I'm just going to go across. This is defensive mode shield wall. Bang, up she goes. And then the other guys now pick up shield wall. So if I go and have a look, you can see there that now it's gone from zero to three. So now they've got a little bit of physical resistance, but nothing can actually reach it anyway. This one over through here has now gone up to four. So we're getting um, physical is only going to take 34%. We've still got this unit over through here, which has got three anyway. This unit in through this side, if I just go and, and select this one and end its, its uh, uh, defense, it uh, will then just go up to seven and six because of the bulwark. And this one as well. And say so this one as well will also be very, very high because of, of what we've just done. This one again will give us shield wall. So if I just go back into shield wall. So get used to using this if you've got the abilities. So you can see there we've got like little symbols are sort of showing up in through this side where we've got like a pinning sort of symbol. We've got the um, the symbols in through this side where we've actually got the different, um, uh, different bulwarks. And so we've got now a 10-6 for this guy, and we've got a 9-4 uh, a for these shield units. Uh, this unit now has gone up to 4-3, actually that was already, already the same. Yeah, so these haven't changed at all. So that's the, um, this is actually sort of how you can make good use of your, of not attacking. So well, let's just go and, uh, we've actually got a spell that we can launch as well if we wanted to. We don't need to, so I'm gonna save my mana, and we've got 30 casting points. So I'll keep it up, if I wanted to, I could do ignite. Uh, so, so 25 fire damage is inflicted with burning and the ground is set on fire as well. Or we've got uh, bolstering chant, which is a healing and buff. So it heals 20, 20 um, temporary hit points and gains two extra defense, but I'm not going to do that either. So let's end our turn. Okay, they've now immobilized us, but that won't matter. It has, has done some damage. See how much damage it's done to, the, uh, to these guys. Now the reason for that is because they just don't have the same defense as the others. So if we go back and have a look at the web, the web is an always hit. It's um, and basically it's it's still a physical attack, uh, but we've got no real defenses against it. So we've taken we've suffered a bit there. Now we we can't move from here. They've actually done what they had to do, but we now have three shots. There's still a retaliation. Uh, if we go back this way, we can do a lot of damage with this. Let's just see if we need to use it. We can still, even though we've been immobilized with some of our units, we can still do what we have to do. So let's just start over this side. 
They can't use the web now, by the way. If the web is, um, it's on cooldown for four turns. So now they're going to have to do the, uh, they're going to have to jump in behind our units. So we'll just go and um, and set this one up. Where we're just going to do a bit of an attack. And this one as well. We'll just use the now. I, I can now use this overdraw the crossbow because we don't have to move. So it deals damage, um, cancels defensive mode, and removes retaliation attack. So the retaliation attack. God, which one do we want to do? It might be worth. It's still probably worth doing this one here. Now let's cancel the retaliation. It can no longer fight back. Uh, I don't get to kill there. And I don't get it there. I do with that one. So I'm pretty better off to shoot this guy here. So that's now burning. So it didn't, it's now, is actually burning. And if we now grab this one, we can now kill it off. And so you'll notice that the melee strikes don't have the same miss ability. Now they will if their morale drops too much. We'll talk about that though in other fights. So that's now been destroyed. Now when that actually happens, when a unit actually is destroyed, if we go back to this unit and have a look at its morale, its ally was killed, so its morale dropped by 10 points. Whereas our guys should be bolstered a little bit. So if we go and hover over ours, we've got plus 10 because an enemy died. And we've only got one more unit left, which is this guy here. And so if, if I just go and have a bit of a look at this one through this side, we're going to have a bit of retaliation coming back, but we're going to do a lot of damage. So let's go and do it. So a lot of retaliation. So we've done a bit of damage. Now it's probably going to jump its way out of here, I would guess. There goes the webbing. Nope, it actually stayed in the fight. There's another change uh, to the actual game itself. What it does is it, um, it now... Um, it still has all of its action points at the start. You've only got one retaliation. Now, our guys have got two retaliation strikes uh, because of the setup that we had at the start. Let's just do more damage in here. That's good. That one's now burning away as well. So this one in through this side, I can then just use this overdraw of the crossbow again, and that will then kill it. Now, I didn't do any, any healing. I didn't need to in this particular instance. Just close that one there. So we ended up taking a bit of damage, which is okay. Uh, no one went up any other levels, so we do want to be doing more of these attacks. Now, what should happen here is we should be given a spider baby uh, because we had set up um, in the last episode to make use of our Imperium. We actually we, we paid a little bit extra to pick up uh, extra units when we do these attacks. So we'll just go and uh, just close this one. And the reward that we get, we got a little bit of gold, a little bit of food. We found the Mirror Shield, which is a Tier 3 uh, secondary unit. So this is a plus 3 defense against non-flanking attacks. Damage Reflection, so it reflects 20% of all damage sustained from attacks back into, into attackers. Now, we can't make use of this really, so that's not going to help us all that much. We do have the Chest Plate of Vitality, though, which we can use. This is plus 2 defense and plus 10 hit points. So we'll make use of that one. We can't use this because of our... I'll show you actually when we get into the screen. In fact, we'll do that next. But we also then have a vampire spider hatchling. And so if this one goes up to champion level, it will then become a vampire spider matriarch. So we want it to ultimately be part of the fights that we do, but we want to keep it safe because initially it's going to be very, very weak and we just need it to uh, essentially evolve. So, so we'll take it, we'll just drag it along. Let's open up the hero screen. And so with the hero screen, the one thing we do actually have is this chest plate of vitality. If I go to all of the um, all of the actual equipment, so if we don't filter by anything, the mirror shield can go into there, but it would then take away the staff, and I don't want to have that happen. But this chest plate can be then placed straight into there, which then gives us extra protection back into this side as well. So that's where we are. Um, let's close that one off. Now, the if we had have healed up, we would still come out with this particular health. We have to heal up out in the actual main part of the game. Now I'm just going to move across initially and I'm just going to keep on uh, destroying all of these different areas. So just while we're here. And I don't think I can get across that one. Okay, so Gem Keep produced the uh, workers' farmstead. So we now can build something else. 
Now we have built ourselves, in fact we can actually now go to the next level, we've now got another another zone. Actually, do we set that on here? Yeah, we did the quarry, we can now go and grab another one as well. So if for every population essentially that you get, uh, you can then go and, and get another expansion point. I can get a forester in through there. It's going to give me uh, two food and three production, but if I put it back in one of the other slots, I can then get more like the gold it's going to be more valuable to me. So I've already got one quarry. I think I'm just going to go with the gold initially. I've got two more turns before we level up anyway. Let's just go that way. So we end up with a mine that's going to get our gold production up nice and strong. And so we need to sort of be mindful of all of these different things. And the production that we're then going to go with is, you notice that the shrine is now boosted because of the quarry that we actually had. So we had the quarry over here. It gives us the boost into the shrine. We can also then build the, the Town Hall 2, which will then allow us to then go and pick up different units that we can then go and build, but we can't build them just yet. So the Shrine will give us plus 10 mana. I think we just go and grab that at this point in time. So it's a bit, a bit faster. Once we actually have that one built, uh, we can then go and get the mana ob obelisk, which will give us 15 ultimately. But we need two quarries to be able to have that one boosted. So try to stick with the boosted if you can do it. Otherwise, just um, you know, just just do what you want to do. Basically, uh, back and through here, we'll just go to the recruit units because we've now finished doing those. I can actually get my pyromancer straight away. I didn't realise that. Um, now there's an upkeep for these. It's twelve gold upkeep. We've got plus ninety five. The arbalist is plus eight. The anvil guard is plus eight. So it's only four more. I think we might go with the pyromancer. So let's go and add one of those into the mix. It does cost me a bit of gold just to get it, to get it all set up. All right, uh, orders required. Back over through here. So um, now there's nothing much we can do in here. This is all um, solid rock, I think. Yeah, we can sort of see this. It's all solid all the way around there. So it's not, it's, um, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to notice it when we come in close, but this is uh, not going to help us. So we'll just go back up. So this is actually a fully enclosed little area. Just to enter this one. Now, is that Artica? No, that's the same guy as before. It's a Berserker. They've got a Fury, which is a ranged unit. They've got themselves Stone Spirits and um, Pathfinder. So they've got a lot of stuff now. We're going to have to be super careful of them. Um, this is one of their cities. If we need to, we can actually probably attack that. Not yet, but at some point. Um, let's just move down this way a little bit and just watch the, the water line. Now, this is the uh, vampire spider, which can actually channel away at some of this stuff. So let's just move it across into this location and uh, get it to channel this. That'll just open this whole area up. Turn. There we are. Sometimes it exposes nasties, but that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to keep this arbalist just to sort of keep moving things away. I think I prefer to keep the others close by, so let's just go and uh, get rid of that. Yeah, that's all one big area. Now we need to, if we can get inside the inside here, we go up by 25 points per turn. If we don't do that on it's five points per turn. So we want to go back home before we come over here. And I will bring the spider in with this little group. That's now six, so it's now full. And we'll move this one across as well. Okay, so uh, I think it's an official announcement that I, Queen Artica, consider you an enemy. So she's actually now uh, made a declaration of rivalry. This is actually how the uh, 
the it's all going to sort of hit and then this is expected fully expected so it's she already really absolutely hates us so we're at uh, negative 655 out of a possible negative 800 <laughs> so it goes negative 800 to positive 800 uh, there's no war justification so she's unlikely to attack us in the short term but the de declaration of rivalry has been um has been given and so this will this will decrease towards a negative three three hundred, but it's already beyond that, so it's not going to go back to th negative three hundred. Uh, will be added to your relations with the ruler. Any grievance gained against that ruler will be increased by forty percent. However, making treaties becomes impossible, and any existing treaty will be broken. So maintaining a declaration costs ten gold upkeep per turn, which decreases by ten gold for each additional declaration. So uh, sorry, increases. Yeah. So declarations uh, must be can be made and ended through pronouncement announcements which is this area through here which we won't worry about we can't do anything about her uh, so she's a bit of a problem and uh, you can see there we're coming last in the actual overall rankings where um, our military ranking is four out of four uh, the um, expansion rating is two out of four the magic ranking is two out of four and the economy ranking is four out of four so we're not doing very well <laughs> so that's okay we'll just uh, say goodbye to her uh, at least we know where she's from uh, let's have a bit of a look and see what else you can see along the waterline. Nothing much. There's another um, another area that we want to be getting a hold of. This is actually the underground passage that goes down into our capital. Just need our turn here. All right. So we've got an empire development skill, so we can go further into these as well. So this is the empire skills. Uh, we now have open to us uh, the province improvements uh, grants plus one stability, uh, city stability for each adjacent pr uh, province improvement of the same type. So if we have two farms next to each other, they're going to help with the stability of the city, which is actually okay, but I won't spend the money of the Imperium on that just yet. I've got 180. Uh, the... Um, Impressment, so Chaos Empire skill, so uh, unit tier one units cost a negative 30% unit upkeep. Now that's already, we're already sort of okay with that one, I think. I might just have a bit of a look and see how that's going. So the tier one units, if we just go back across and have a look at these. So our tier one unit, uh, for example, these guys in here. So the upkeep is six. So that's, um, and it should be eight. So we've lost a little bit. So I think if we actually go with that one, I think that's going to be worth doing because we're going to end up with a lot of these units. So we'll just go back and close that one. So I will actually go back to the Imperium and we will actually pick this one. There we go. And we, now if we close it and have a look and see if that's made any change, it's now four. Great. Okay, so we've now got... To, you can never have... Less than 50%, by the way. So um, that's, the, that's the cheapest it can possibly be. So we can get a lot of Tier 1 units very, very cheaply. And I think that a lot of these sort of shield-type units will be great. We'll just spit them out, and uh, away we go. So we'll end up with sort of like a, a swarm of them, ultimately. Uh, we'll just close that one. And uh, again, what we want to be doing here is just getting them inside our zone. And we've got this one as well. This one's got... It's pretty much healthy. Uh, now what else have we got? Spells ready to cast. So we've got fiery arrows. Now, what this one's going to do, it's going to give us five, uh, plus four fire damage and minus two physical damage and a 30% chance of inflicting burning, uh, over, like which is a, a damage over time effect. Now, unfortunately, the crossbow is a bit more useless than the bow because it's only got the one shot. So other like other bows will actually do much better damage than ours will in terms of that 30%. So uh, affects skirmish units and range units. We've got two in the army. So the upkeep per unit in this instance, because we've cheapened the upkeep, is only one upkeep per unit. So uh, we're going to cast this one. But that's it's the upkeep per unit that I don't actually really like in the game, to be honest. I sort of wish that that wasn't a, a feature. I don't mind paying upkeep on summoned units, but not on those. Uh, we produce the shrine this time, so we can now sort of have, have a bit of a look inside. We can actually go and get the next expansion as well. So what we might do is we might grab ourselves a farm. Um, now I don't want to waste these locations here. So I don't have anything else that's sort of special. 
other than those two. I might, um, yeah, so the farm, I, the farm I do need, I don't actually have a farm, so I think we'll just go that way. And production through here. So now we have the vendor which is boosted which gives us extra gold and we've got the workshop which will give us extra draft. I might go that way because we're going to be able to then start to get our, our cheap units pretty quickly if we if we have this if, if we have the actual workshop. So that requires the farm to be to, to actually boost it along. Alright so that's done. Now when we get to uh, the, the boost here is to have a population of five which is in five turns time. So we'll wait until we've actually got the boost for that one and so we can get that one a bit cheaper so we've still got the vendor to get as well i could actually just chain that one in there so we've got four turns for that one through there we'll find something else to do at that point in time we can actually start the process and, and then have it sort of work for us if we if we need to so fiery arrows it was research was completed we haven't actually applied this one yet that's just come through there's a unit enchantment from the tome of pyromancy so we'll select new research Again, have a little bit of a look. There's only next time is coming in two research cycles. Now we've got the um, the lesser magma spirit in through this side, which is a um, uh, tier one recruit unit. This is a, uh, a battle mage unit. It's an elemental, which means that we'd have to summons it in. Um, now that's not going to be. We're not going to get all of the everything back on that one because it's actually a magical unit. The rune of industry. Is going to give us um, uh, the fighter units are going to have uh, sorry grants so bolstering which in, so this is for um, grants non-industrious units so anything that we bring in from outside will then be will get the same effects of like bolstering that we actually have so that's something we could get we've got the steel fury chant so all friendly units they lose all stacks of bolster defense and bolster resistance uh, for each stack lost they gain strengthened and fortune which then changes it so we can actually then flick it. Uh, if we use this chant, we can then flick from a purely defensive mode into a purely attacking mode, or not a purely attacking mode, but we can go into a into a, a full-on attacking mode with our units by strengthening them up. So strengthened is going to give us a plus 10% damage. And so for each stack of bolster defense that we end up getting, uh, we get more of that. Now the bolster defense comes if we start to take damage, and then fortune gives us critical hit chance. And so we can get a lot of that as well. So this one might be worth getting. I don't mind the idea of this one, but I'm probably going to end up with um, using most of my mana with with mundane troops. So we'll just go with the Steel Fury Chant. Um, just go this way. Now, if we have a bit of a look, these guys will heal up pretty quickly in here. So I'm just going to leave them where they are. Leave that one. There's nothing it can actually do in this instance. Yeah, you can go all the way over there. Oh, there's a, um, a bit of a an extra that we sort of got over that side. Just leave that one where that is. Okay, they've got another hero. So be Mr. Beamstar. Crossbow hero. So they've got rattlings. at all so we'll just pick up the food from there that will help with the growth that should actually give us a bit of a boost along so we should end up a little bit faster along with getting to that level five by the time we uh, are ready to do things um, it's all looking good we'll just keep on sort of moving along and just opening up more of the more of this uh, big open area underground here uh, we'll end our turn here oh I've gone miles over time guys miles over time. So I'm going to leave it here. So thanks for watching. I will catch you in the next episode.